we next look at the iso 14000 and 14000 series iso 14000 is a series of international voluntary environmental management standards iso 14000 has a multifaceted approach to meet the needs of the business industry governmental authorities non governmental organizations as well as consumers in the field of environment so the important word here is environment and environmental management iso 14000 specifies the requirements for establishing an environmental policy which determines the environmental impact of the products or services it plans environmental objectives and implements programs to meet these objectives and also conduct a review and of management as well as corrective action. ISO 14000 has developed standards that help organizations to take a proactive approach to managing environmental issues. Thus, ISO 14000 is defined as a series of international environmental management standards, guides and technical reports. This definition is available in the textbook on industrial pharmacy 2 by Dr. Ashok Hazari. So you can refer this textbook. ISO 14,000 family of environmental management standards are such that they can be implemented in any type of organization, not just a pharmaceutical organization. It is believed that ISO 14000 is helping to meet the challenge of climate change with standards for greenhouse gas accounting, verification, emission trading and for measuring the carbon footprint of products. The first and foremost objective of the ISO 14000 series of standards is to promote effective management systems in organizations. These standards specify requirements for establishing an environmental management policy, determining environmental impacts of the products or services, and planning environmental objectives as well as implementing programs to meet these objectives. These standards also seek to provide cost effective tools that make use of the best practices for organizing and applying information about environmental standards. The ISO Technical Committee has developed ISO 14000 family of standards. This family of standards was launched to provide a practical toolbox to assist in the implementation of actions that are necessary for sustainable development. So you can go through the website or any standard textbook to read the list of published ISO 14000 standards. The first environmental management system BS7750 was published in 1992 by the BSI group. The International Organization for Standardization, that is ISO, which has earlier published the ISO 9000 series, created the ISO 14000 family of standards in 1996. And these standards underwent revision in 2004. So currently, there is a big list of upcoming ISO 14000 standards such as ISO 14045 to ISO 14066. Thus, this ISO series of 14000 standards is constantly evolving driven by and driven by market need and its major objective is to promote effective environmental management systems across organizations. Following are the different aspects of environmental management that are addressed by the ISO series. Let us look at what these, uh, what are the uh, objectives of these series. 
environmental management systems environmental auditing and related systems environmental labels and declarations environmental performance evaluation life cycle assessment these are the various objectives of environmental management that are addressed by the iso 9000 series and this family of standards provides a practical toolbox which assists in the implementation of actions supportive of sustainable development so the mantra here is sustainable development what are the benefits if any organization go in goes in for iso 14000 certification let's look at it having this certification helps in identification and control of the environmental impact of activities product or services so whether the organization is uh, into selling of products or is a service industry it will help to reduce the environmental harm that is caused by its activities this uh, certification helps to continuously improve the environmental performance of the organization it helps in implementing a systematic approach to setting environmental objectives to achieve the targets and to demonstrate that they have been achieved lastly legal and regulatory requirements of regulatory agencies and environmental agencies are complied with when this certification is achieved the next the next topic that we are discussing is nabl the full form of nabl is national accreditation board for testing and calibration laboratory okay again i repeat national accreditation board for testing and calibration laboratories national accreditation board for testing and calibration laboratories or nabl in short is a constituent board of the quality council of india qci nabl has been established with the objective to provide government industry associations and industry with a scheme of conformity assessment boards accreditation which involves third party assessment of the technical competence of testing include and it includes medical laboratories calibration laboratories testing providers and reference material providers so in short this is a body that that certifies and validates various testing laboratories so a pathology testing laboratories medical calibration laboratories reference materials providers all these need to be accredited by the nbl which is a constituent body of the quality council of india nbl accreditation system complies with iso 17011 and the apac or the asia pacific accreditation Corp uh, cooperation it based on the evaluation of nabl by apac in 2000 nabl is now a signatory member status of apac and the international laboratory laboratory accreditation council that is ilac under their mutual recognition arrangements nabl offers accreditation services in a non discriminatory manner the nabl website is updated continuously with respect to the status of the accredited laboratories and their scope of accreditation list of laboratories which are suspended or withdrawn or scope of accreditation is partially or fully withdrawn is also available for the benefit of the users thus if you need to understand the quality of the goods that you are purchasing or if you need to know the quality of the laboratory where you are getting your samples analyzed you need to see its nabl status whether it is nabl accredited and this is available on the nabl website 
so if you are the owner of a testing laboratory or a calibration uh, laboratory or a reference material provided you have great benefits if you are a member if you have got yourself accredited through the nabl so what are the benefits of such an accreditation and remember that in the current global scenario for a product of one country to be freely accepted in another country it has without undergoing extensive retesting a certificate from an nabl accredited testing laboratory goes a long way the world trade organization accepts the results of an nabl accredited laboratory in any country so if the testing is done in one country by an accredited laboratory this test result is acceptable in any other country thus nabl has successfully removed the technical barriers to trade this is a major step towards mutual acceptance of test results and measurement data across the indian borders okay so nabl is basically an indian uh, uh, an indian body but it has gained global acceptance and it allows the materials to be transported across indian borders with no retesting therefore let us look at what are the benefits of accreditation international recognition of your product so if you have tested your product in an accredited laboratory your product has international recognition access to the global market lot of savings of time and money because retesting is not necessary enhanced customer confidence and satisfaction a robust quality management system scope for continuous improvements better operational control as you can look at the results and then carry out changes where necessary you have an assurance of accurate and reliable results because of all these factors there's an overall reduction in the cost involved and minimal losses due to defective products nabl has provides accreditation in all major fields of science and engineering so it is not only pharmacy but fields diverse fields which like biological chemical electric electronics mechanical fluid flow photometry radiological forensics electrotechnical mechanical optical medical devices radiological etc etc which require testing or calibration are covered by nabl under the scope of nabl as i told you in the previous slide if you go on the nabl website you can find the list of laboratories testing laboratories that have been accredited for them thus interested customers can search and identify laboratories accredited for by nabl for their specific requirements by going to the nabl website or the directory of accredited laboratories the customers who use such accredited laboratories enjoy greater access for their products in the global international market as well as the domestic market and because there is no time lag no retesting necessary savings in terms of time and money are achieved so what in conclusion what does nabl how does nabl help formal recognition of competence of a laboratory by nabl has many advantages so if a testing laboratory affiliates itself and gets itself accredited by the body nabl that is the national accreditation board for testing and calibration laboratories then these are their advantages a ready means for customers to identify and select reliable testing measurement and calibration services so a customer by going to its site can shortlist a reliable accredited laboratory which will cater to their testing measurement and calibration services 
the customer has an increased confidence in the reports that is testing reports or calibration reports that are generated by such laboratories do, uh, by carrying out testing or by calibration or by medical testing okay so there is greater assurance of accuracy and reliable results the results from accredited laboratories are used extensively by the regulators for the public benefit in the provision of services that promote an unpolluted environment safe food clean water energy health and social care services so samples the by uh, that are to be tested by the regulatory bodies are sent to such accredited laboratories and the resulting data can help in create a cleaner healthier and safer environment for the population such accreditation helps in better control of laboratory operations and feedback to the laboratories as to whether they have a sound quality assurance system and are technically competent so such laboratories get feedback from nabl uh, inspectors about their systems operations and whether they are technically competent this helps the laboratories to improve their services testing by such accredited laboratories helps in participating in tenders that require independently verified laboratories so whenever let us say the who comes out with a scheme for uh, production of, and manufacture of pharmaceutical drugs for supply to third world countries and they ask for tenders in such a case these certification by these independent accredited laboratories is very beneficial in and helps in participation in the tender process there is a perceived potential increase in business due to enhanced customer confidence and satisfaction so whether the customer for the pharmaceutical product is the from the uh, domestic market or the international market when he sees this certificate issued by the accredited laboratory the customer has greater confidence in your product and this will lead to increase in orders and increase in business accredited laboratories also receive international recognition which allows their data and results to be more readily accepted in the overseas markets accreditation helps to reduce cost for manufacturers and exporters who have their products or materials tested in these laboratories by reducing or eliminating the need for retesting so retesting need not be done this helps in reduction of cost customers can search and identify the laboratories accredited by nabl for their specific requirements from the nabl website or directory of accredited laboratories so this is what i just discussed with you short while back the nabl grants recognition to testing laboratories as per the standards given here with calibration laboratories as per iso 17025 medical laboratories proficiency testing providers and reference material providers the scope of nabl is applicable to clinical biochemistry clinical pathology hematology immunohematology microbiology serology histopathology cytopathology genetics nuclear medicine and many other areas this is a flow chart that discusses in short the procedure for accreditation of any testing laboratory by nabl the testing laboratory which wishes to get itself certified will first apply so the first step is application for accreditation by the testing laboratory acknowledgement and scrutiny of this application by nabl and review of the entire document by the lead or the team leader or lead assessor 
This is followed by if the document is found to be okay. This is followed by a pre-assessment of the testing laboratory by the lead assessor. If the findings are favorable and there are no non-compliances, then a complete final assessment of the testing laboratory is carried out by the assessment team. Once the inspection and assessment is over, a report is gener generated and submitted to the core committee of the NEBL, which then scrutinizes the report and gives its recommendation so the committee will give recommendation for accreditation and based on the recommendation if the recommendation is positive then approval for accreditation by any bl is uh, given to the testing laboratory this accreditation certificate is issued to the testing laboratory thus application for from application for accreditation to the issue of the accreditation certificate it is the national nabl and its team lead uh, which is led by a lead assessor which carries out all the activities leading to final accreditation the last topic of this chapter is good laboratory practices let us try to understand what is good laboratory practice good laboratory practices or glp was first introduced in new zealand and denmark as early as 1972 and later on in the us in 1978 glp was uh, initiated in us following the cases of fraud generated by toxicology laboratories in the in the data that was submitted to us fda by certain pharmaceutical companies false claims of certain chemicals as toxicologically safe was submitted to the us fda and this led to creation of the regulations on glp in 1976 the environmental protection agency also encountered similar problems in the data and thereby the guidelines for glp were laid down glp is a quality system of management tools uh, management controls for research laboratories and organizations to ensure uniformity consistency reliability reproducibility quality and integrity of chemicals and drugs non-clinical safety test okay so basically glp is a quality system which covers organizational process and conditions under which non-clinical laboratory studies are planned performed monitored recorded reported and archived the aim of GLP is to ensure quality and integrity of the safety testing data that is submitted to the government. So GLP is all about safety. It is to ensure good laboratory practice ensures the safety of chemicals and pharmaceuticals. So it ensures the integrity of the data that is submitted to the government for issue of research permits. GLP is not limited to chemicals and pharmaceuticals. It also applies to medical devices, food additives, food packaging, color additives and other non-pharmaceutical ingredients. What is the difference between GMP and GLP? This slide answers this question very effectively. GMP applies to the entire drug manufacturing process while GLP applies only to the safety testing phase. In US, the US FDA has implemented both GMP as well as GLP. This is a brief history of the origin of GLP. In the early 1970s, the US FDA became aware of cases of poor laboratory practice all over the United States. They discovered a lot of fraudulent activities and a lot of poor lab practices. For example, equipments were not calibrated. Incorrect accounts of the actual lab data. Lab data was not uh, reported accurately. 
testing systems were inadequate or uh, not calibrated or not up to the standards the principles of glp are categorized into 10 categories which are discussed which are uh, written here in this slide we will discuss each one of them in brief just read through these uh, principles and then we will shift to the detailed description about each of these principles moving to the first principle that is test facility organization and personnel here we are talking of people what is the responsibility of the people who are employed by the organization in the testing facility the people that are employed should have the knowledge of glp they should have access to the study plan and the appropriate sops to be followed they should strict comply with the instructions given in the SOPs. The personnel who are involved in doing the testing should record and maintain all the raw data. These people, study personnel, are responsible for the quality of their data. So, they should ensure accuracy of the data. They should ensure, they should exercise health precautions to minimize the risk. So, even while doing testing, handling should be done in the appropriate manner as prescribed in the SOP. And uh, to summarize, they should ensure the integrity of the study. They should not compromise on the correctness of the data. Second is the quality assurance program. What is the role played by the quality assurance per, uh, people in the good laboratory practice? These persons should have access to the updated study plans and the SOPs. They should verify compliance of the testing procedure or the study plan to the principles of GSP. They should carry out periodic or frequent inspections to determine whether the testing methodology is complying with GLP. They should inspect the final reports for accuracy and uh, completeness of data and they should routinely report the inspection results to the management. Thus, personnel who carry out testing should be uh, if uh, qualified, they should be trained, they should report accurate data and this data should be verified and cross-checked by the QA person. Third, Third is the facilities. What are the facilities that should be available to carry out testing? Now, testing is the manufacturing area is very large, well equipped and complies with GMP. But what about the testing facility? The testing facility should be of suitable size, construction and location. Different testing activities must be separated from each other. In the test systems, and uh, individual chemicals and those which are hazardous, toxic, flammable should be isolated from each other. There should be suitable rooms for the diagnosis, treatment and control of diseases. So if any testing personnel is suffering from any uh, disease or is having some uh, discomfort, he, should, he or she should be diagnosed and suitably treated and should not be exposed to the chemicals that are being tested. And there should be well ventilated and clean storage rooms for all the samples and testing material. Fourth is what is the apparatus material? What about apparatus materials and reagents that are required for testing? The apparatus should be of appropriate design and adequate capacity. All the apparatus should be clean. So, documented inspection, cleaning, maintenance and calibration should be periodically done and reported. Apparatus and materials should be such that they do not interfere with the test system. Chemicals, reagents, solutions should be freshly made, should not be nearing expiry and these should be labeled specifically to indicate their identity, expiry as well as specific storage conditions. Fifth point is related to the test system. 
whatever is the system or the reagent that is required for doing the physical or chemical testing must be freshly prepared and comply as per the SOP and complying with the specifications. Similar case with biological test systems where microbiological monitoring or sterility testing is supposed to be carried out. All due precautions should be taken. Records of the source of the samples, the date of arrival, arrival condition of the samples to be tested should be done. So there should be proper recording of the receipt of materials to be tested. The te these materials which are to be tested should be identified, should have proper identification. So, so they should be kept in containers and labeled. The containers in which the testing systems are placed should be clean and sanitized. Where necessary, the area should be subjected to pest control and the names of the identity of the pest control agent should be well documented. Test samples which are received by the laboratory for testing, there should be records of its receipt, how it was handled, who handled it, how it was sampled or how it was stored. The sample should be characterized completely. Its identity should be tested. Stability testing should be carried out of the test items as well as the reference items. The stability of the sample should be checked not only uh, as such after withdrawal from the container but also in its original container. Experiments to determine the stability of the product in bulk should also be carried out. So if you have the uh, liquid syrup which is being tested from its individual bottles, some testing should also be carried out in the bulk tanks, manufacturing tanks. Adequate samples should be withdrawn from each batch such that testing and retesting is possible. Coming to SOPs. SOPs form the backbone of GLP. It, any activity to be carried out should be laid down in, a, in an SOP. Thus, SOPs are written procedures for uh, laboratory programs which define how to carry out specific activities as per the protocol. <coughs> the SOP should contain the steps to be carried out in a chronological order, in a sequence. And the purpose of these SOPs is to explain how the procedures are to be carried out. SOPs should be framed for every activity that is carried out in the testing laboratory, including routine inspections, cleaning of apparatus, cleaning of the instruments, maintenance of the instruments, testing facilities and calibration facilities. Appropriate actions should be taken in response to equipment failure and documented. Record keeping is very, very important. Keeping rep records, reporting the results, storage of samples, mixing of samples, making the reagents and retrieval of data are all important. There should be SOPs for all these activities. Raw data should be defined and handling of raw data should be written down as SOPs. Analytical methodology should be written down in the form of SOPs. How to carry out the study? Before the test is carried out or before the study is carried out, planning has to be done. So prepare the study plan and in the study plan, write the following points. Identification of the study. What is the sample being tested? Records, what, are, what is the data, when was it manufactured, when, when, what is the expiry, what are the storage instructions, all dates, important dates should be mentioned. The test methodology should be mentioned and references, appropriate references for these methods, whether this is a pharmacopoeia test, then the pharmacopoeia edition page number and if it is an unofficial test, then which is the SOP for the test, should, so reference should be given. Information related to the sponsor and the facility where testing is to be carried out should be given. And how to conduct this study, how to carry out the test should be known and the personnel should be trained in carrying out the study. How to generate the report? Once the study is completed and the results are available, report has to be generated. Such a report should contain 
a few of the, a few of the important points that uh, contents of such a report are given here information on the sponsor that is who has who, uh, who has given the sample for testing and the test facility where the test was carried out starting dates and completion dates of testing quality assurance program statement description of the reagents materials and methods results and storage details of the test samples retest samples reference items raw data final report etc should be done thus accurate adequate reporting of study results is very very important finally what the all the data generated and additional samples storage samples reference samples retest samples how should these be stored so the last point that we are discussing here is storage under good laboratory practices is the procedure for storage and retention of records and samples so what is important is the study plan the raw data and additional samples inspection data and master schedules sops maintenance data calibration records if any material is disposed of uh, due to expiry or due to any other reason then the reason has to be justified and documented and finally a uh, index of all the material that is records and materials should be prepared and should be available for ready reference so this is as far as the procedural part is concerned what about the facility how should the testing facility be the facility where the apparatus instruments equipment are placed and the personnel are carrying out the testing activity so a good laboratory should be free should be airy it should be well lit it should be free from smoke smell dust etc good ventilation proper illumination and preferably natural light should be available the laboratory should be air conditioned with humidity control this is very very necessary for the long life accuracy of the instrument high tech instruments there should be adequate space available for sampling measuring and testing instruments there should be proper arrangements for testing all electrical points safety points should be adequately there should be adequate earthing fire safety should be ensured there should not be dead spots or any uncleanable spots in the floors walls and ceilings proper areas should be demarcated for storage of incoming samples quarantine samples test completed samples failed samples retest samples etc so well demarcated area should be available for isolation of samples at different stages there should be a proper sample collection place as well as there should be a proper procedure and provision for packing and disposal of the tested and exhausted samples okay so this was a brief overview about good laboratory practice and the principles involved in the scheme finally as budding pharmacists this is what this is the practice that you should inculcate and implement in your daily life whenever you are doing the testing of any materials these are the basic instructions that you need to follow keep all use whatever is necessary and at the end keep the things back at its original location store heavy things at the bottom and if possible on trolleys so they don't need to be lifted every time give a tag a name to everything location every location quarantine under uh, testing sampling not done passed failed give a tag give a location to everything follow the everything has a place and everything at its place principle that is be neat tidy replace everything from where it was taken whatever location you have prepared here for the samples are different stages prepare a list or prepare a layout and display it keep handy ladders which you can use for uh, procuring things which, uh, that are stored at the top 
every material that is present in the laboratory must have a name and identity and objective a purpose etc follow the first in first out or fifo rule to prevent accumulation of older laboratory chemicals ensure that whatever chemicals and reagents are available they are exhausted well before their expiry okay so these are some of the practices that you can implement as a part of gl with this we have completed the uh, topic of chapter 4 and i hope that all these concepts have been very clearly understood by you you have standard textbooks available in the library which you can refer and read much more information on the matters that have been discussed in my lecture series in industrial pharmacy 2 unit 4 for further if you have any doubts or queries you can approach me with the same thank you